Well, I hope you have enjoyed the break and the weather. It's almost like fall has arrived, and welcome to the first day of October. Let me begin by asking, what are you proud of? Hope you got something to be proud of. Maybe uh, think about it for a minute. Maybe something great that you've done in your life. Uh, something you wouldn't mind bragging about just a little bit if somebody pressed you. It could be, could be your bloodline. Yeah, you see all these commercials on TV about ancestry and tracing your roots to all parts of the world, and maybe you, you end up and find out that you're only like seven degrees from Kevin Bacon or something that can make you proud. Uh, could be your education. Maybe you got uh, maybe you got seven degrees there. I don't know about that. Some position that you hold, or some some business accomplishment, or maybe something about your kids. There are all kinds of things if we think about it that can make us proud. But you know, when it comes to being proud of ourselves or listing some great accomplishment or accomplishments in our life, I don't think any of us would have a thing on the Apostle Paul. In the third chapter of Philippians, Paul gave a list of his credentials, almost a resume of sorts, and we're going to be there as our text today. It was, it was a list of things which he said could lead to uh, what he mentioned as confidence in the flesh. And if you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to turn to Philippians chapter 3, and uh, verses 4 through 14 are going to be our text. And I want to begin by looking at this list of attributes from the Apostle Paul. We're going to be looking at this text today, and we're going to look at it next week as well. Same text, both lessons, and really as we focus on the idea of gaining Christ. First of all, Paul talks about some gains in his life. Philippians 3, beginning with verse 4. If anyone thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcise the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. That's quite an impressive list. And I want to take a few minutes and go through the items on this list. And as we do, I want to approach it a little bit like a resume. I'm going to call it a super resume, uh, and as you'll see, is when the reason why as we go along. And the first qualification on Paul's, what I'm calling his super resume, is a super bloodline. Paul says he was circumcised on the eighth day. In other words, he had been a Jew from birth, and that's what all the, the Orthodox Jews would do with their children, their male children. They'd circumcise them on the eighth day. Not only that, Paul says, I'm of the stock of Israel. Now, there were a lot of Israelites, and they were sons of Abraham. But Paul was saying, I'm Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And he even used the covenant name for Jacob, which was Israel, this special name that God had given to Jacob. The name Israel, it signif signified a, a special relationship with God. But even more than being this Jew from birth and the stock of Israel, he's of the tribe of Benjamin. Yeah, can you top that one? He's really digging deep. Of all the patriarchs in the tribes, if you think about it, only Benjamin had been born in the promised land. And, and when the kingdom split under Rehoboam, only Benjamin remained with Judah. Oh, there's something about Benjamin and Jerusalem, the temple. It stood on the soil of the tribe of Benjamin. So, boy, if you can trace back and, and go to Benjamin, you've really got something going on. As a matter of fact, the first king of the Jews, he'd been from the tribe of, take a wild guess. Yes, yeah, it's, it's Benjamin. His name was, do you remember the name of the first king of Israel? It was Saul. It was a name that was given to lots of Jewish boys since then, and one of them was this Saul from, from Tarsus. So, great pride coming from the tribe of Benjamin. Super bloodline, but then Paul says, I'm, I'm a super, I'm a super Hebrew. He puts it this way. I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. One thing that he was saying when he said this was, I am of absolutely pure racial descent. Well, I'll tell you about my bloodline and my heritage, but I'm a super Hebrew. And even more than that, he puts himself in this small group of Hebrews who took great pride in their adherence to and perpetuation of the Hebrew language. We're going to keep it pure. We're going to keep it real. 
it was a mark of the most devoted of Jews. You may remember an occasion in the 21st and 22nd chapter of Acts. Paul gets a mob stirred up while he's preaching. He did that quite often. And as he's given a chance to speak in the 21st chapter of Acts, he speaks to them. And there's great silence, especially, the text says, when they heard that he spoke to them in the Hebrew language. And then he goes up and he gives his defense. And, and, and the text says, when he spoke Hebrew, they became even more silent. Boy, this guy is the real deal. You may remember his testimony. I am a Jew, he says. I was born in Tarsus, a city of Cilicia. I was brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law. So the people are listening because he's speaking in Hebrew. And then he says, Gamaliel, oh, Gamaliel, you went to the most preeminent university of our day. You studied at his feet. You're studying our traditions. You are you are born and bred. You are literally dyed in the wool. He's got the bloodline. He's, he's the super Hebrew. But more than that, he's a super religious kind of guy. Paul said, concerning the law, I was a Pharisee. I think most of us know, or at least we've heard about the Pharisees. Their name literally means the separated ones. Yeah, they had sort of pulled themselves out. Now, that's not a bad thing. The church is the call out. But, but they took it to an extreme. They, they pulled themselves away from the, the normal riffraff followers of God. They were, they were super special. They devoted their lives to religious observance. There weren't a lot of Pharisees around. Their numbers never got above 6,000. You'd think they ruled the roost, but no, they're a very special elite group. They were the strictest sect of the Jews. They considered themselves to be the purest of the pure. And when it came to religion, Paul is the cream of the crop. I'm a Pharisee. No, 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 no. I'm a Pharisee of the Pharisees. You think Pharisees are something special? Well, if you took a group of Pharisees and you picked super Pharisee, it would be me. Okay. But he doesn't stop. No, he's not finished. He's super zealous. He says, concerning zeal, you want to look at my life? I persecuted the church. It was an interesting, weird thing, sort of, to brag about to the church. Well, we're not finished yet. But he says, look at my life. And when you see what I did, how devoted I was to the cause, boy, you're not going to top my zeal. And zealousness was highly prized among the religious people of Paul's day. In the 8th chapter of Acts, we read that Paul made havoc of the church. He dragged off men and women to prison, and he separated houses, and he went from house to house trying to find anybody who's following Jesus. The next chapter opens in Acts chapter 9. Saul was breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He went to the high priest. He asked for letters to the synagogue at Damascus if he found any people who were of, this little phrase, of the way. The way of life. The way of living. The way to God. I'm looking for these followers of the way. I want to tie them up and bring them back to Jerusalem. Now listen to Paul's own testimony in Acts chapter 26, beginning in verse 9. He says, I thought myself that I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Here's what I did in Jerusalem. Many of the saints I shut up in prison. I received authority from the chief priests. When they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. I punished them often in every synagogue. I compelled them to blaspheme. I was exceedingly enraged against them. I persecuted them, even the foreign cities. I go after them. I'm going to chase them. You can't deny I'm one of the most zealous guys you've ever seen. He drives his point home when he writes to the Galatians. And he says, you've heard of the way I used to be in Judaism. I persecuted the church of God. And he puts this phrase in, beyond measure. There is no one that can come close to me on the persecution scale. Again, I think it's a strange thing to brag about. I advance in Judaism beyond my contemporaries, beyond my nation, being more zealous for the traditions of my fathers. You will not top me. Super bloodline, super Hebrew, super religious, super zealous. One more thing on his resume. He's a super law keeper. Boy, you're looking to Paul, you're not going to find much. He tells the Philippians concerning the righteousness that's in the law. Blameless. Really? Well, that's what he said. He was claiming to have kept 
the law as well as any man could, I might add, outside of Jesus Christ, but he wouldn't have added that at, at the time, not when he was going through it. Oh, he had a great deal to brag about. Listen to what he says. Verse 4, again, to remind you. If anyone thinks he has confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day, of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Top that. And he knows no one can. Say, that doesn't sound like Paul. No, it doesn't. It sounds like Saul, but it doesn't sound like Paul. Why is he doing it? To make a point, because he's saying, first of all, if we're comparing apples to apples, I got all of them. And I think, wow, look at this guy. No brag, just fact. But he doesn't stop there. It's the next verse. We'll put it up on the screen, verse 7. But what things were gained to me, these I've counted loss for Christ. And there's the powerful statement of faith. Paul says, yeah, I've got all the credentials. I've got all the degrees. I've got all the learning. I've got all the devotion. I've got all the, I'll put myself up against anybody. And then I'll take it all and I'll put it in debt. It's loss. Paul says, I'm willing to give up everything I've achieved in my life on an earthly basis in order to gain Christ. I've counted it loss for Christ. And this statement, it, it wasn't just one that was made off the cuff or in some moment when, when Paul felt especially close to God. As a matter of fact, he goes on to make emphasis on the point. Listen to verses 8 and 9 of Philippians chapter 3. Indeed, I count all things lost. I count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And I count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which is from God by faith. Paul says, I'm going to count everything as laws if I can gain Christ. And he wasn't just dismissing his gains with some kind of feeling of indifference. Rather, and he viewed them as repulsive. He uses the word rubbish. Some of you who have the, the noble language of the King James Version, you see the word dumb. Point me. He says, that's what I can, all these things I've mentioned, it's dumb. It's animal excrement. It's rubbish. It's trash. It's thrown on the garbage heap. But before this is impressive, he's, and Paul would say, I know, everybody in the world is going to be impressed but it's not about the world. I take it all and I throw Why would you do that, Paul? He says there's something greater than all of these things. It's gaining Christ. It's not that these things can't be used and that these things don't have their place. Paul isn't saying don't go to school, don't learn anything, don't, don't care anything about your, your family. It's, it's not bad. It's a matter of perspective. And he says, when I compare the two, there's, there's no comparison. It goes on the trash heap because I want to gain Christ. He's not only taking his things off the trash side of the, of the ledger, he's throwing them on to the debit side. It's not a neutral, it's a loss. The reason being, they are his own righteousness. They are his own achievements. You know, we sing about being dressed in Christ's righteousness alone. That's, that's our goal, faultless to stand before the throne. The only way that can happen is through Christ. Not through anything we do, not through anything we pay. Everything that we have over here, none of it can contribute to the price of our salvation. That was the blood of Jesus Christ. And Paul says, I look at everything I've done, it's lost. Why, Paul? In order to gain Christ and be found in him, and obtain that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. And then in verse 10, 
Paul mentions three things in conjunction with gaining Christ. And I want to look at those three in depth. And that's where we're going to be going next week. For right now, what I want to say is that Paul gave up everything in order to gain Christ. He thought it was worth it because, as he says in verse 11, my goal is to attain to the resurrection of the dead. With all he had done, and even all that he had given up, and all that he was now doing in his new life for Christ, Paul still didn't think he had arrived. One reason was he still had life in his body. He still had breath. He wasn't finished. He understood the position of his gain, and he counted them as lost, but there was still more to do. Listen to verses 12 through 14. Not that I've already attained, or am already perfected, but I press on, that I may lay hold of that for which I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forward to those things that are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. There's that list. But Paul has his eye on a prize that's worth more than all this world has to offer. That's why he was going to keep going. That's why he's going to keep on keeping on. That's why he's going to keep pressing on the upward way. New heights he's gaining every day. That's why he's able to say what things were gained for me. These I've counted lost for Christ. And I'll tell you one way that we can give up the gains that we have in our personal life. And again, nothing against education. Uh, nothing against money, nothing against family, but, but how do we give up those gains in order to gain Christ and count them as loss? One way we do that is to use everything on this side to the glory of God. You've got that extra degree, how are you using it? You've got a family, how are you using your family? You've got material wealth, you've got an extra car, you've got room in your house, you've got a job that's blessed you with, with an income. How do you use all of that to the glory of God? I think that's part of what Jesus said when he said, whoever wants to be my disciple, if he does not forsake all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. It's not that we never use anything with which we've been gifted, but we use it to the glory of God. That, that's forsaking it. In other words, everything we have, it's, it's God's. I, I don't hold on to it. I use it for his glory. And when God needs it, it's his. I, I don't hold on to it. I don't count it all as gain. I count it as loss. And then God may say, you know what? I could use that car. I could use the intelligence that you have. I could use, not that he needs it, but he wants it. He wants us to be used in his service. He wants the blessings he sent our way to be used to bless others. We forsake our gains for the cause of Christ. Does that mean selling everything we have and giving it away? Perhaps. I'm not going to say yes or no. Perhaps not. Does it mean using everything we have to the glory of God? Absolutely. And whatever gains we have in our life, education, money, whatever it might be, they should never be about what we can get out of it. They need to be about how can I use what God has blessed me with in order to bless others and most of all to help them gain Christ as well. That's what people need most of all, more than any kind of achievement. They need to gain Christ. They need a relationship with Christ. They need to be saved. I think I heard someone say that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Did I hear that? Yeah. Very recently, I believe. Sure. That's where everybody falls. And we can help lead them to Christ if we will. And I would think if we start looking at our conscience and everything that we have piled up on the gain side that few, I would say probably maybe no one's going to out top Paul. He had the money. I know how to abound, he would say at one point. Yeah, he, he knew about that. He knew about being a wealthy, educated well-connected person. But look at his example. 
and what he did with that and where he was willing to place it in order to help other people find Jesus. We look at that example, and the question we have to ask ourselves is how are we going to use our gains for Christ? What do we do with the gains that come our way? Do we have a proper perspective on those gains? Can we truly say this little phrase? It's the title of our lesson. My richest gain, I count but loss. We're going to sing that song. The phrase is in the song. Be warned. It's coming up. You can sing it or not sing it. You can sing it and say, yeah, I, I, I really mean that. That's a powerful phrase. I hope you mean it. It's a song that we quite often sing before communion. When I survey the wondrous cross, and it's so appropriate to sing it as we're focusing on the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. But there's more than one time to focus on the cross, and that's the rest of the time. We always need to be looking at the cross and the example of Jesus. Can we say, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride? That same prize that Paul was striving for, it's available to us today. But first, we have to count all things as loss in order to gain Christ. We need to keep pressing on. We need to be gaining new heights every day. We've already sung about that. And we do all through surrendering those gains to Jesus. We sing about that too. I hope you think about the words that you sing each Sunday. I surrender all. And it begins with surrendering our bodies. We surrender our bodies in baptism. That very action is one in which a person has to just let themselves go as someone else is, is putting them into that water, putting them into that grave, putting them all the way under and then resurrect, raised to walk in newness of life. And that new life is one that is answering the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Have you answered that call? Most of you have. But have you followed through on your commitment? If you need to be baptized this morning, understand what a commitment that is. It's, it's a serious thing. Understand that when you're baptized into Christ, you're surrendering. And in that statement, you should be saying, I'm counting all things lost for Christ. If you're ready to make that step, if you need to ask for the prayers of this church, if there's any need we can help with in a public way, Come in front, let us know. Let's stand and sing this old song together. Where